Hello, I am Leslie Craig, the Public Health Advisor for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in the Region 5 Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Region 5 covers the six states of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. On behalf of my office and my partners, the University of Minnesota State Adolescent Health Resource Center, Minnesota Department of Health, Minnesota Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and Minnesota Chapter of the, American, of the Academy of Family Physicians, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Screening for Adolescent Mental Health and Depression, Implementing Universal Screening and Referral in Annual Preventive Visits. Slide, please. We know that problems with mental health often start early in life and that half of all mental health problems begin by age 14. Depression is the most common mental health disorder affecting nearly one in eight adolescents and young adults each year. This slide shows mental health and suicide related results from the 2017 Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System. In 2017, nationwide, 31% of high school students had experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness during the 12 months before the survey. Adolescents who experience symptoms of depression most of the day, nearly every day, for at least two weeks in the year, are having a major depressive episode. You go back to the previous slide, please. Thank you. This slide with data from the 2017 National Survey on Drug Use and Health shows increases in major depressive episodes among adolescents aged 12 to 17 and young adults aged 18 to 25 from 2015 to 2017. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends screening for major, major depressive disorder in adolescents aged 12 to 18 years. The task force recommendation indicates that screening should be implemented with adequate systems in place to ensure accurate diagnosis, effective treatment, and appropriate follow-up. For more information about the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force recommendation, including rationale, clinical, and other considerations on the U.S., you can find that all on the USPSTF website that's listed here. Today's webinar will highlight standardize screening instruments and discuss addressing positive screens, including the practice of warm referral with a focus on adolescents and young adults. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to some important webinar logistics. Today's webinar is being recorded and you are currently in a listen-only mode. Use the chat box to submit any questions throughout the session and we will designate time at the end of the webinar to answer as many of your questions as time allows. Additionally, our webinar hosts, the University of Minnesota State Adolescent Health Resource Center, will distribute an evaluation following the session. In the next week, a recording of the webinar will also be emailed out. Now, a little bit of background about my office. In early 2016, we established the Region 5 Adolescent Health Network. The regional network addresses a myriad of adolescent health issues, and we've designed this year's programming to focus on topics related to mental health and well-being. This slide includes details on how you can sign up for our email listserv to receive updates. Today is National Depression Screening Day, which falls annually during Mental, health, Mental Illness Awareness Week. Visit this web link to learn more, download materials, and find ways to get involved. I'd also like to acknowledge our sister agency, the Office of Adolescents Health, and their national call to action, Adolescent Health, Think, Act, Grow, or TAG. This call to action aims to raise awareness about the importance of adolescent health, engage stakeholders, get adolescent health on the national agenda, and spur action through a comprehensive strength-based approach. You can learn more about the Office of Adolescent Health and TAG by visiting their website and signing up for their e-updates. Now, before I hand it over to our presenters, a quick disclaimer. Please know that the content and views contained in these presentations do not necessarily represent the official policies of the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I'd like to thank each of you, our participants here in Region 5 and across the country, for joining us for today's webinar. We have a quick poll that we'd like you all to complete to help our presenters to get a sense of who you all are. So if you could please complete the poll as it comes up. 
will take about 30 seconds to complete that. It's on the right side of your screen. Okay, feel free to close that out whenever you'd like. I'd now like to welcome our presenters. Kristen Teipel, Director of the State Adolescent Health Resource Center at the University of Minnesota. Katie Sharla Leshock, Child Health Consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health Child and Teen Checkups, EPSDT. And Dr. Joanne hoffman Jecka, Pediatrician at South Lake Pediatrics. Kristen. Thanks, Leslie. My name is Kristen Teipel, from, uh, and I welcome you from the State Adolescent Health Resource Center at the University of Minnesota. We're also a partner in the Adolescent and Young Adult Health National Resource Center. And I just wanted to tell you really quickly about our center. Um, with funding from the Federal Maternal Child Health Bureau, we are able to partner with state maternal child health programs and their clinical partners to work on ways to improve access and quality and equity for healthcare for young people. And we've recently added an additional focus on integrating behavioral health into primary care and supporting policy and clinical practice change around depression and mental health screening. We've been really lucky to work with and learn from our colleagues from the Minnesota Department of Health um, as they've taken on health and depression screening to a new level. So I'm going to turn it over to Katie to give you an overview of this work. Katie, I'll leave it to you. Hi, uh, this is Katie Shala Leshock. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner in Minnesota, and for the last seven years, I've been working with the Minnesota Department of Health as a child health consultant. So one of my areas of specialty is mental health screening. So I'd like to just share with you what we in our in our state have done at a policy level and around clinical supports to support mental health or depression screening for adolescents throughout our state. And then I really look forward to having some time in a few minutes to hear from Dr. Hoffman, who's a pediatrician in our state, and she'll share with you some real practical information and stories from her practice with her clinic and how they've implemented screening and the impact that it's had on them and their, um, their community that they serve. So first, I'd like to just start with a real quick poll before I launch in. Um, we will uh, be looking, like I said, we'll be talking about policy systems and clinical strategies. We'll be looking at, uh, we'll also be looking at comparing standardized tools that are recommended in Minnesota for screening, and these would be similar to ones that would be recommended elsewhere throughout the country. And then we'll also talk about response and referral options. So what we'd like to know from you in this poll, so if you click on the little arrow next to polling on your, the right panel, you'll see the poll show up. So when it comes to regularly screening adolescents for mental health or depression at each well visit, where are you or your clinic on this continuum? And if you're not a clinician, think about clinic partners that you work with in your community or your state or territory. So are you at pre-contemplation, which is A, you're thinking about screening, you wanna learn more, B, you're planning and working on implementing screening. C, you already are screening, although it's inconsistent. It might depend on the provider, the day, the mood. Um, D, your clinicians in your practice are screening routinely among adolescents for mental health concerns. E, you're both screening and you've got referral down as well. You know where to send those um, concerning results and um, young people and families. And then finally, F, not only are you screening and referring, but you're also tracking outcomes. So just mark where you fit best in that continuum. And we'll close it in a few seconds here. And then after a moment, you'll be able to see those results. So meanwhile, I'll just share a little bit more. I actually work in our state's early periodic screening diagnosis and treatment program. That's a Medicaid, a federal Medicaid program. All states and territories have it. Um, and in Minnesota, we call it child and teen checkups. So we work with our state Medicaid agency to provide health recommendations. We work with clinicians and other people around the state who provide preventive health screening, including mental health screening. 
Um, and my personal job is to provide training around that and a little bit of work with policy. So if you think about your state, think about whether you know who your Medicaid agency is. Is it your Department of Human Services? Do you happen to know um, where to find policy around screening for mental health? And then um, um, do you know who some partners are in terms of influencing policy? Uh, one thing we were able to do with our Medicaid administrative funding is that one of our largest counties um, used a part of their Medicaid funding to develop a statewide marketing campaign for child and teen checkups. Because as you know, young people don't necessarily like to come in for well visits because why would you go see the doctor if you're not sick? And so when we engaged young people in this campaign to develop the messaging, um, they said that one of the biggest values that they would get out of a well visit is being able to talk about mental health concerns, either their own or those of their uh, family or friends. And so you can see here one of our emoji equation marketing campaign um, posters that was used on buses and billboards and then across Facebook, Instagram, and some other online platforms. Um, and you can see that it leads them to the getctc.com where they can get more information about how to get a checkup. Uh, this is a view of our state's um, EPSDT or Child and Teen Checkups Periodicity Schedule. This is based on bright features as is required uh, by Medicaid and um, it's tweaked just a little bit for kids who are eligible for Medicaid just because they are at higher risk for uh, mental health and health conditions. So as you can see, um, one of the specific areas that is indicated on the schedule is social emotional or mental health screening. So beginning in infancy, we recommend social emotional screening, but by the time the uh, young person is 12 years of age through 20 years of age, mental health screening is actually required in order to get the enhanced bundled rate that our Medicaid agency offers for clinics who bill for a complete child and teen checkup that includes all of the required components. So there's actually a financial incentive for them to complete the required components. As we've mentioned already, um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommends depression screening for 12 to 18 when there are systems in place to respond to those results. The American Academy of Pediatrics Bright Futures also explicitly recommends screening for 12 through 21 years of age. Uh, the other thing that we have going for us in Minnesota is that through our Health Care Reform Act, there was the development of this Minnesota statewide quality reporting and measurement system, which is called SQUIRMS emphasis mine because I think that's the greatest abbreviation ever, especially in state government. Um, so this statewide uh, quality reporting is actually a required cl uh, clinical quality program that clinics across the straight state participate in. And so back in 2011, we gathered stakeholders to determine pediatric preventive measures that stakeholders determined were the most important and appropriate to measure for pediatric preventive health. And in that group of stakeholders, which included uh, clinicians, our academies, um, health plans, and other quality folks, they determined that mental health screening for adolescents was both evidence-based and one of the two most important things to measure in our state in order to impact um, the health of young people. And so in 2013, they tested out this quality measure with a few clinics who were willing to test it out. And then they uh, finalized specifications in 2014. And we began, began that required clinical quality reporting in 2015. And so this is along with other measures that clinics were required to report on, such as um, diabetes management in adults. And we found that our rates of mental health screening for adolescents went up um, exponentially almost. Um, back in 2014, we either had no screening happening or unmeasured screening. And then in reporting year 2015, that was at 45% of adolescents who had presented for a well visit within the last year who had received mental health screening, standardized mental health or depression screening. The following year, measure, year of measurement, which was 2016, that was up to 70%. And then our most recent year of measurement, which is 2017, 80% of young people across the state uh, were getting mental health screening at their well visits. 
uh, sorry, I'm moving too fast here. Uh, we did notice some pretty significant differentiation by geography, however. So as you can see in the urban areas, which you can see in the Minneapolis and St. Paul area, in the little nook on the right, 70%, um, this is back in 2015 when our, our statewide rate was 70%, you can see that that was heavily weighted by the urban areas, whereas outside of urban areas, screening rates were closer to 50%. So clearly we have some work to do to better support providers in rural areas to do screening. Uh, when it came to the instruments, along with that screening measurement, a list of um, tools was provided. And these are uh, all the tools that were found to be psychometrically sound for depression or broader mental health screening in adolescents. The most commonly used tools are the PHQ-9 and the Pediatric Symptom Checklist. So I'll talk a little bit more about those. The other thing you can notice on this slide is that Several of the tools are available publicly, but the ones that are starred um, do have a cost to them. They're licensed tools. So this is a PHQ-9. I'm guessing most of you are familiar with this because even in the adult world, they're using this very commonly for depression screening. And so we um, found that there were good studies that indicated that the PHQ-9 modified for teens is valid for 12 and older. Uh, this particular sample, if you Google PHQ-9 modified for teens, you'll find lots of examples online. So I didn't include one link. Um, there is the, the, PDI, or the patient health questionnaire website, which is where you can uh, download the regular PHQ-9, which you can use for 13 and older. Um, this one includes questions that, nine questions, and these are based on DSM diagnostic criteria. Uh, nine questions and you can, the patient can answer not at all several days or more than half days or nearly every day in the past two weeks. As Dr. Hoffman will share later, some versions of the PHQ-9 modified for teens include additional questions about suicidality. We did do a special look into the PHQ-2 and though it is well validated for adults, there are fewer studies in adolescents for the PHQ-2 but we did find that there was adequate sensitivity and specificity when you use the PHQ-2, but as the AAP recommends, it really should be a first stage screener. If the PHQ-2 is positive, then you should move on and do the full PHQ-9. So the PHQ-2 is just the first two questions of the PHQ-9. Um, and in fact, this is what a lot of our hospital systems have built into their medical record system is they do the PHQ-2, and if it's positive, it automatically brings up the PHQ-9. Um, and in, for any of you who work in clinics, you know that having this uh, built into your electronic record system is really one of the best ways to ensure um, easy access and kind of triggering or queuing providers to do what's needed. Um, another very popular public domain tool is the Pediatric Symptom Checklist. The advantage of this tool is that it's a broad mental health screening instrument. It does not just focus on depression. Um, it includes internalizing concerns like anxiety and externalizing concerns like aggression or hyperactivity as well as attention concerns. And this tool can be used as young as four years of age through 16 years of age. There's a parent and a youth version. Uh, both the parent and the youth version that have 35 items are fully validated and ready to go. The youth version that has 35 items is validated and available for use for kids that are 11 or older. Um, the shorter version, which has 17 items, is not fully validated. So in our state, we don't recommend that. You can find the PH, or sorry, the Pediatric Symptom Checklist for free online, either at, on the Massachusetts General Hospital hyperlink there or from Bright Futures. But the Massachusetts General Hospital link will get you to more resources around other languages that are available, as well as scoring and interpretation. Um, in order to support providers, we made available a list of recommended instruments along with a detailed table. So if they hadn't chosen an instrument yet, they could compare each of the available recommended standardized tools and compare them by sensitivity, specificity, reliability, cultural and linguistic applicability, um, cost, and they could also find where to download the instrument. So if you click on the hyperlinks in these slides, when you receive them, you'll be, you'll be brought to those resources. Of course, 
one of the biggest questions providers have around screening is what do we do with the results? And the common feeling was that in Minnesota, especially outside the rural area, there's, quote, nobody, end quote, available for mental health services. And this is not an unvalid concern. This is a real concern. Um, however, a lot of our work has been done, has focused on letting providers know where the resources actually are. Um, some of the clinics have really worked hard at integrating mental health services into their primary care, and Dr. Hoffman will share more about that, but there are lots of different ways to partner with community agencies. In Minnesota, um, our Department of Human Services is also our children's mental health agency, and they have um, worked with Medicaid to ensure good reimbursement for services, and they've also uh, managed to pro um, provide grants to mental health community mental health agencies all over the state. So everywhere where you see a, a light blue county in our state, there are community health agencies who are providing mental health services in the schools. And so in 2015, and I'm sorry, this is the most recent data I have for this, 278 school districts had mental health services available within the schools and over uh, 15,000 unduplicated uh, were being served, students were being served in those um, mental health services. So obviously this is a great approach if you're able to, in your state or territory, develop um, school-based services. It helps the child not miss school and it helps the parent not miss work. It just generally makes the services both more acceptable and accessible. Um, I will say that as someone who's really been focusing on mental health screening and developmental screening over the last seven years, I was, um, both excited and frustrated to learn about a couple of really important resources that are available that I didn't even know about as someone who has really been digging into this. So um, I would just encourage you in your own state to really um, connect with your Medicaid agency, connect with your, your state or territory children's mental health agency, and others, uh, your state association or academy for psychology, psychiatry, um, and really um, pull together what are those resources that are available. So in our state, we have a combination of some state funding and other um, uh, reimbursable services and other funding streams that are supporting the psychiatric assistance line. Um, this is done through Prairie Care, which is one of our large mental health service providers. They actually offer a free service by phone, which offers a licensed child psychiatrist who can answer questions about medications like ADHD, depression, or anxiety medications for referring providers. And I have to tell you, this is a Minnesota service. Um, so if you're in Wisconsin or Iowa or the Dakotas, um, but you're seeing a Minnesota kid, please call the line. If you call anyhow, you never know, they might be able to answer your question. I'm, I'm sure they won't appreciate me saying that, but we'll see. Um, anyhow, and they also have licensed clinical social workers who can answer um, questions about local mental health resources. So this is not only a good resource for um, medication consultation for prescribers, but it's also a good resource for families and providers who need to find a mental health um, service provider for the young person in their life. Additionally, um, in Minnesota, we have what's called the Fast Tracker, and that was one of our um, mental health associations or foundations really did work on their own and had um, literally a college age um, acquaintance build a website at low cost to help um, track down statewide mental health and substance use disorder services. So that's available online too. So you, you please feel welcome to ex um, explore those resources online and see what might be available in your own state or territory. And then finally, I'll just list a few other services that we have available to um, child and teen checkups and other screening providers in our state. Um, we have uh, a one-page document that lists all the developmental and mental health screening for use in well visits from infancy all the way through young adulthood, and that includes postpartum depression screening um, that happens in the context of an infant well visit. That's that first link. We have a pretty well-developed website that focuses entirely on early childhood developmental and social-emotional screening and referral, and then a couple of fact sheets as well. So my contact information is here or generic child and teen checkups email. Please feel free to email or call if you have questions. And now I'm really happy to pass the ball to um, uh, Dr. Hoffman, who will share more about what's been done in um, her clinic around screening. 
Hello, I'm uh, Joanne Hoffman Jekka. I'm a pediatrician in the greater uh, metropolitan area of the Twin Cities. I'm, um, I'm a general pediatrician. I, I do a lot of work around mental health that's just come out of uh, necessity and interest. Um, we're a large single specialty group, uh, private practice, 38 docs and nurse practitioners in six locations. Um, I'm really happy to be invited today to kind of talk about you know, what the experience is to be in, uh, in primary care. Um, when I started promoting screening at our offices, which we started more than 10 years ago, uh, the feedback I got was basically, I don't, I don't do mental health. Uh, my, my partners are like, that's not what I do. Um, and ultimately, we know that about 4% of children deal with high blood pressure, and we screen for this at every visit. We've always screened for it. But rarely does it prove to be a significant health concern, and when it and and when it does, it's typically easily managed. Uh, on the other hand, suicide is the second leading cause of death, ages five to twenty-four. I think that age even goes higher, but it's moving up. It's really a sad statement. Um, meanwhile, we're screening for cardiac disease, and that's not even close on the list. So how can we ignore 20% of our patients? These mental health disorders are at high risk of morbidity and really high risk for, for death um, based on suicide and other um, poor choices. Um, how can we say we don't have time for that? So why do I care? Well, um, we have about 27,000 active patients. We do about 6,000 physicals ages 12 to 18 um, per year. And we do screen every single patient. Um, that does seem like a lot of work, and I'll go into how we make that be not such a burden. Um, but ultimately, the data is this. We have five times more pediatric patients that are admitted due to a mental health crisis than due to asthma. 12% um, of our total admissions are due to a mental health crisis. And this isn't a practice, again, that sees the entire range of patients. Um, I like to think the, the voice and the pediatrician or the family practice doc is so important is that we do take care of the whole child. We know that physical symptoms can manifest in emotional or behavioral symptoms and vice versa. You can have headaches, stomach aches, um, poor sleep problems, things that might come to us that may actually have emotional or behavioral um, uh, roots. So who's better suited than we are to address these problems? I'd like to approach this as a developmental presentation of um, mental health problems. We can look in the first years and begin to see some behavioral problems that may be related to separation or temper tantrums, or there may be difficulty with getting, children getting along with others, and we should be beginning to address these at these ages. Um, you can see ADHD present as early as preschool years or early school years, anxiety, we see more, of course, it can present at any time, but as you move into elementary and middle school, with depression presenting typically later. Um, and so the, for us, starting to screen just at that 12 year, which is what we're requesting, is too late. We need to start looking sooner, um, and that may be through the parent, but to say, how can we prevent? We know that some have multiple diagnoses, and you can begin to see a progression. Um, considering the whole process in the rail of epi epigenetics, kind of a hot buzzword these days, but saying, yep, there's a genetic predisposition and there's environment. We can't change genetics, but we can work on the environmental factors and hopefully avoid a progression in this, in this process. So we actually do a variety of screening tools. You see the ones listed. We actually start with the MCHAT when the kids are younger and some emotional behavioral screening. Um, and then as we get into age four, We'll have the, the parents do the pediatric symptom checklist. And by 12, we have the, um, the children themselves doing the PHQ-9. And we also do the GAD-7, which is a general anxiety, a general anxiety disorder screener. Um, they're simple, straightforward screens. They are free. And, and they're just screens. They're not perfect. But they're definitely easy to do, and they, they're easy for tracking progress. So we utilize these screens when we're following kids for their mental health conditions or for ADHD to see if they're developing any comorbidities. The key word is it is a screen. It's not to let it scare you. We have an opportunity to ask kids to come back. We have an opportunity for, for intervention. And the earlier we intervene, the less difficult. 
So we talked about the PHQ-9. I call these kind of the, uh, the bonus questions, but we've included this in our screener. Um, you know, the, you can see these. If you've checked off problems, how difficult have these been? Um, and that speaks to impairment. And we utilize, we'll show you in a moment, a similar question at the GAD-7. We know how important it is in determining impairment. So based on, on your answers, how much of a problem is this? And then asking that broader question of over the past year, have you felt sad or depressed? And then the past month, have you thought about ending your life and ever in your whole life have you made a suicide attempt? Um, it gives an opportunity to quick answer those questions. And quick story I have, um, there's a boy that I see, I've seen him since he was an infant. I see his siblings. He's uh, 13 years old and he came in and he just whipped through zeros on all his screens. And, but on the question of, has there been a time in the past month when you've had serious thoughts about harming yourself? He said, yes. And he said, yes, he had tried to kill himself. And um, when I spoke with him alone, he, um, I asked about those questions and he really didn't want to talk about, but ultimately said he had gotten really angry with his family and he had stood up on a chair and attached a belt to a, a, a rafter in his closet and had come very close to hanging himself out of anger. And so sometimes you can have a, a child that's at high risk that doesn't present as being depressed or anxious. They present, um, maybe there's an impulsivity there along with um, some family connection problems. That child I'll have to, happy to say is, is doing very well. He was not pleased with me that day when I needed to bring his mom in and loop her in and get him to a therapist. He was not happy but he is doing much better now. Um, this is the question related to, um, excuse me, let me get back to my slides. Um, so then this is the question related to GAD7, same thing, how, how difficult was it? And sometimes there is a starting point. So the school start is listed there. Um, so this seems like a lot. How do you get started? Well, we certainly didn't start with all of this. It starts out with having somebody that really cares, is passionate about the topic. Um, it's great when there are guidelines and regulations and that does get people started, but it's so much better if you have someone that's really eager and engaged and, and feels like they can spread that energy. So you need to engage the whole team. And that goes from, from reception and scheduling right through clinicians and administrative and support staff. The administrative staff needs to value what it takes to practice good medicine and that sometimes um, for staff it, it takes them more time or it takes more administrative time to make these things happen but that they're worth it. And then we, um, to engage in care coordination, we were lucky enough to start our care coordination through a grant um, through, um, through the state of Minnesota, Minnesota Health and Human Services. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what care coordination can look like, and then to develop community partners. We certainly can't do this as an island. I think a fear of screening, uh, and this is at a start for us, is, okay, you're screening, you have a positive screen. What are you going to do about it? You have to be able to do something about that screen. So what our workflow looks like is our um, receptionist will give the screens at the front desk. Now, ideally, maybe you have an iPad or some electronic device. We don't currently. Um, the receptionist gives the screens to the parent or the, or the teen or both. Our medical assistant scores the screens and puts the results into our electronic medical record. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. And then they put the paper copies into the out guide for the clinician to um, have at the visit. So you can physically see the individual questions. Um, those are eventually saved into the chart into a confidential section, so they're not, um, they're not uh, accessible to, to, to parent result for the results. Um, clinician asks follow-up questions if they're needed. Um, they record what their thoughts are in the electronic record, and I'll show you that as well, how to streamline that. Um, and then a referral is made. All of our mental health referrals are done through our care coordination, and we'll talk about that more, but um, so that we're able to track and our care coordinators can make sure they're connected to um, the referral agency. And then the patients are added to an appropriate registry. Um, this is an example of what our scoring looks like in the EMR. You can see the top heading mental health depression screening. And, um, and then the GAD7 and our, our medical assistant puts in the score. And then there's a drop down menu for us to choose from for the results. For anxiety, it's just either negative screen or it's consistent with anxiety. For the PHQ-9, there are more result options and I'll show you that in a moment. In this particular example, 
the score was eight, and that's consistent with mild depression, which was a score between five and nine. And then this child also had a, a PSC done, and you can see each, um, each of the breakdown of the scores, the attention, internalizing, the externalizing scores. And you can see that we've listed the cutoffs. You don't need to remember what those individual cutoffs are. Um, total score in this situation is 15 because we use the PSC 17, even though that's not been fully validated. We've found that with all the paperwork the parent has to do, it's more likely to get, to get done. Um, and so you can see for this particular patient, I wrote the scores are somewhat improved because I was actually tracking someone. Um, I could see a progression of improvement, that there was no suicidal ideation, and that this patient was already connected to mental health care. So now the information is all there. We've addressed those results um, in, into the record. Uh, this is an example of the drop-down for the PHQ-9. You open up back the results. We'll have a drop-down, and you can choose the, re choose the appropriate results. And then next to it, it shows what the drop-down is for follow-up. So I might have said the results were discussed, follow-up is routine, or I want you to follow up here, or I've made a referral, or they're already connected. Um, this is a good place to write down any, um, to, in the blank box to type in any suicidal concerns there were, how they might have been addressed. There's also another location to do that. So um, in our record, you go through each of the screening, and then there is, is that, that sum of what happens. Um, next, we've uh, worked on creating a warm handoff. Now, it, each of you I've noticed are in all different places in this process. Where we started was basically, I call it the black box referral. You say, gosh, you need to be seen, and um, this is probably pre-screening, and call your insurance and see where you can go. And, you know, maybe we heard something, you know, give me a call if you have any more problems, but we didn't really have a, a good way to make a recommendation. Um, we followed that up by everyone pooling that who do you like to refer to um, as we develop more relationships and we create a, a master list of here are some places that a person could refer to and we give specific names. That progressed to developing relationships, um, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. As part of this process, though, we needed, did need some help. And so we were able to start our care coordination program with a grant. We currently have three care coordinators. We've had as many as four. Um, we have one who um, his background is in preschool education as just a wonderful, warm person and has developed great skills in navigating the mental health system. Um, we have another care coordinator that is an, an RN who has been in triage with our, our office for many years and has developed additional skills. And finally, we ended up hiring um, through, through, again, another grant source, but hired a Somali language interpreter who just had a wonderful, warm, kind way with our Somali families, which is a, um, we have a fair number of Somali families, and so has been able to act as a care coordinator. These care coordinators don't just do mental health. They, um, we've developed a healthcare home process um, and healthcare home regist registry so that they can help with the multiple needs um, and helping patients in a variety of ways. But you can have anyone in your office start the process. You can have anyone, almost any job level, just tell me, call, were you able to make that appointment? Were you able to get that referral? Um, can I help you? You can have someone assist with, um, with those connections. Um, you can have, have them be a, a, a present for check-ins. Hey, you know, Dr. Hoffman wanted me to call and see how things are going, um, or have you been able to go to school, you know, and sometimes I'll even have them do, they'll actually utilize the PHQ-2 and the quick phone call. So it depends on your job level and what you're comfortable with, but it extends that direction. One of the key aspects for us, though, is making sure they're keeping their follow-up appointments that they're coming in. When they call for a, a medication refill, for example, we're able to say, gosh, you need to come on in. We've developed systems around that. Um, and then they're able to help with a warm handoff. Kind of the warm handoff to us might be to care coordination. It might be more directly to mental health. And again, I'll address that soon. But it feels nice to have someone that's helping you make the connection. Um, and that's kind of that concept of a warm handoff. Ideally, the warm handoff would also extend directly to the mental health provider, um, and that is your ideal. That is often harder to do, 
um, but can be better accomplished through you know, appropriate release of information. Um, so the, the next phase we did was to start building community relationships. And we just plainly looked and say, who do we like to refer to? And we started meeting with these local health, mental health providers. Um, we had uh, several groups that we co-located with, meaning we had one of their therapists come into our office. Um, that, it worked fine, but what we discovered is they tended to go into their own room and see the patients. Eventually they had a full um, client load and were no longer taking new patients and they really didn't interact with our clinicians. And so it didn't end up being quite the collaboration that we'd hoped for. It really was shared office space, but it wasn't truly collaborative. We continue to develop our relationships to say, okay, maybe working in our space isn't so much. We started having uh, our care coordinator be able to talk to a care coordinator at one of these other organizations. And uh, that allowed for the, um, to say, hey, did so-and-so follow up? And are they continuing to go to their appointments? And, and allow for some of that interchange just to see that things were actually happening. Because we know the no-show rates for, um, in mental health are nearly 50% for that initial uh, first or second connection. So um, really driving that. And part of the collaboration, we define terms to say, okay, we, how do we define um, non-urgent, urgent, and emergent? So when we maybe call on behalf of our patients, if it's more emergent, they're able to directly address saying, yes, we can help you get somebody in in the next one to two days. Or no, we're not going to be able to help with that. Um, and with the goals of the partnership is that they would do whatever they could to get our patients in so we can get them help avoiding ending up in an emergency room situation. Urgent we defined as needing help within two weeks and not urgent was saying more like within four to five weeks, but our target has always been about two weeks. Um, finally, um, the, uh, Katie already spoke of the psychiatric phone support on our PALS line. If you can find any psychi psychiatric groups that might be willing to collaborate with you in this in your own states, this is a wonderful line. Um, you can actually go online and schedule an appointment um, to have a phone conversation with a psychiatrist so we don't have this phone tag. I can call both today. I can make an appointment at 2.20 p.m. and I can call and speak with a psychiatrist. Um, they can meet you at whatever la level that you are at for initiating a first medication to doing something more complicated. They provide education and there's no judgment. Um, they don't, they don't uh, make you feel bad if you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing or I'm not sure how to manage that. So this is a wonderful um, service and there may be psychiatric groups that are willing to provide that because we really don't have enough psychiatrists to meet the need. The, um, another thing that we did was looking at how to address crisis. And with this, we empowered, really empowered our triage nurses to help with asking the scary questions. Um, really, the scary questions are, you know, to determine what's the risk for, for self-harm, uh, suicide, homicide, what is, what is the risk? And empowering triage to be able to ask that. And often when it's on the phone, it really is through a parent, but, but teaching the parents what questions to ask, how to um, decrease risk, and to provide emergent resources when needed. So they're really our first line, and they've become quite good at it, and we've done some education around that and helped them to be brave. And the second part of being brave is as clinicians, to help clinicians feel like they have the tools to see some of the kids when they're feeling like they're in, in crisis, to, to be able to at least, um, if they're clearly suicidal, um, have indicated intent, obviously they need an emergency resource. But when they're more in a anxious crisis or a depressed crisis, that's someone to be brave and have them in your office, that you have someone that's not, does not have suicidal intent. We don't want to see them um, or significant suicidal thoughts. Uh, we don't want to see them end up in the emergency room. They're typically set home and the families feel like, well, that was a waste of time and it was traumatizing, so be brave and get them into your offices. We keep on-hand resources, uh, uh, brochure on anxiety depression along with our local hospital locations and phone numbers, our metro crisis resources, so that's handy and able, uh, avail uh, availability to give out this information. Um, and then we look at, we're looking at safety planning. This is newer, but we really like the My3 app. Um, if you open that up, I've downloaded it on my phone, and I'll actually bring my phone into a room and be able to show a, show a patient or the parent, and they can bring that app up themselves. 
and it has um, several features. Um, one, it has contact numbers that quick dial from your smartphone, but it also has a safety plan that looks at things like what are identifying triggers, um, what are things you can do to calm yourself, who are important people in your life, what are the reasons, you know, what are the things that you love and live for. Um, and they really appreciate having that resource. As we know one of the most important things in preventing suicide is to buy time to help someone de-escalate from that sense of crisis to um, settle themselves, to calm themselves, and get more time extended from the in, um, intensity of that thought. So we help with um, uh, working on that kind of planning. Um, South Lake Pediatrics, where are we at right now? We have developed a fully integrated um, mental health program. We've partnered with Prairie Care Medical Group, um, and we currently have in our six locations, we have two therapists. Actually, we have three therapists, one is part-time and one psychiatric doctor, nurse, doctorate level nurse practitioner. We have, we, this program works because we literally share clinical and professional space. Our office desks are next to each other. We um, share our reception, our scheduling and care coordination. Um, we have direct collaboration between providers. We are able to do a true warm handoff um, and um, enable to discuss. We share our notes. We do not share our, our professional contracts. We don't share billing. We don't share our insurance contracts. We do share our notes. Um, their, their notes go into our record. Uh, they are scanned in and put in a confidential section, so they're not, um, we don't risk the release of those records when our records are released, and they are able to access our records. This is all done through a, a comprehensive release of information. Their focuses are on brief intervention and needs assessments, so they'll do the full range of therapy, but that means we're looking at six to 10 visits in, in, um, and sometimes shorter to really focus on assessment and um, skills. Um, and this has been a wonderful relationship that has developed over time after our, our collaborative effort. Um, so, you know, address the needs. We screen. Address the why are we doing that. Let people know why we do this. Why is it so important? Um, find champions, create structure, educate, bring speakers in, provide opportunities for people to get education, develop your community partners and care for your whole child. Thank you. It's really uh, nice to have the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. This is Kristen Teipel again from the University of Minnesota, and I, I want to thank both Katie and, and Joanne for your wonderful information. And I just wanted to uh, bring you into our mental health joys here as we are trying to deal with slides that are doing very odd things on our WebEx platform. So I appreciate you bearing with our mental health challenges here today. But this time now is a time for questions and answers. Uh, if you would like to type in any questions in the chat box. We'd love to hear uh, what's on your mind or if you have any experiences you'd like to share with us. We did have an earlier question about what was considered a positive screen on the PHQ-2, which actually one another participant had answered, which is a score of two or more um, and should be followed up with a PHQ-9. Um, but are, if, are there any other questions? Please feel free to, to type them in. So we have one that just came up. Have you analyzed any patient data to find trends and insight to inform prevention efforts? So I assume this would go to Joanne. Well, um, we have definitely made those efforts. We have a committee that works together um, to try to look at what are, what are the data points that can help us in our efforts. Um, Having consistent physicals does seem to matter. Kids that have come in regularly where we have an opportunity to address that versus just coming in for sick appointments, um, that seems to be a really good opportunity um, to, to intervene. Um, we have found that our, our numbers for, in terms of when our care coordination team is actively involved, that we have much higher rates of connection to care um, up to 80 or 90 percent of connection to care. That doesn't quite address the, um, the prevention question you have. I, I don't think we've analyzed any data on that, that question. 
Okay, thank you. Another one question for you um, from Jed Miller. Do you have any input on how to measure the quality of the screening process at the practice level? In particular, not just that screenings are being completed and referrals were made were applicable. Rather, how can we measure the quality of the interaction that should result from the screening being performed? Or is that something we just isn't really measurable? Well, that's a that's a, a uh, that's a good question. So that you are saying that that the screening is an enhancing the quality of the visit. I'm I'm hoping I'm 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 sort of reading that that correctly. Um, I don't know if it's measurable. I I do know that 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 from my experience, and then also looking at Katie's data on the what the teens say they want out of a child and teen check-it, they do feel like there's much more of a connection. And as you've done that type of screening, ask those questions, that our office becomes the safe place for kids to go to ask those mental health questions or for parents to go. They, they know that because we've done those screens, because we've interacted and asked about that, that it's important and that we're a good place to come. Um, and we've actually become known in the community for our, our mental health care as well, partly on that basis. But I'm not sure that it's, that it's measurable. And certainly that sort of speaks to personalities as well, as you can imagine. Some are just going to be a little bit better with the interaction part. Thanks. We have another one for you from Ryan, and it just moved on me here. Um, sorry, hang on. It's about school-based health centers. So, so do you have any tips for care coordination among school-based health centers and primary care providers to best, best support behavioral health? Absolutely. I mean, this is something that we are really working on. Um, and I think it, a lot of it comes down to just that darn release of information. We created a bi-directional release. And then we have, you know, checkbox that says we can share assessments and reports, we can do coordination of care, and we can do verbal consultation. So that, um, and then we have our kids, if they're, um, you know, kind of in that preteen teen range, they'll sign it as well as the parent. Um, it just allows that, that opening um, for referral. And I'm so happy when any of our school-based mental health centers reach back out to me. Um, one of the areas that primary care is still lacking is maybe to, to give information back if we do some sort of medical intervention that this is what we're doing. But having that information is so essential, and I do think it comes down to that release. And then I'll often handwrite in, eager to collaborate or communicate, and having that mechanism. I think there's a lot of work to be done still on secure, safe um, email. Um, we don't feel like that's where it needs to be, so you're still left with this kind of fax paper thing um, and um, verbal communication, which is ideal if it's possible. But I think that that looking at, at being consistent on both ends of that this is important and this matters. Wonderful. A couple more things. Um, people are asking if we will be sending slides and if the resource links will be coming along with this and if you'll be able to access. And yes, we will send that shortly after the webinar. So do look for those in your email. Um, Joanne, another question for you. Leslie sure. asks, how many pediatricians do you have on staff seeing and screening those 6,012 to 18 year olds? We have. <laughs> We have 38 docs and nurse practitioners, many of which are part-time. Um, and we do have a, a fairly generous schedule. Typically, we allow for 30 uh, minutes for most of our physicals, for most of our well-child checks, and up to 45 minutes for um, most of our adolescents. That's sort of dependent on the, on the clinician. It certainly means that our, our profit margin is narrower. Um, but it, it, it does allow a little bit of extra time for that. Okay. And then Erica asks, um, I understand that any referral made for external child and teen checkup um, for ages 11 to 17 aren't followed up by the county public health teams. Joanne, do your care, coordination, do your care coordinators follow through on these? Um, Certainly, if we've made referrals, we treat all of, we, we, we manage all of our patients in the, sort of the same fashion. Um, so whether they're part of um, medical assistance program or private pay, um, and that we make the referral, and then um, we make efforts to, to, to make sure that they've connected to care. And I, I should say make efforts. It's, it's not 
it's not a perfect system by any stretch. That's our ideal. And sometimes it's just hard to get a hold of parents, and, and you, you certainly can't ask the mental health provider if they came unless the release of information was signed on the front end. But that's what works the best. And yes, we would do that for, any, for anyone to have the release of information, ideally signed on the front end, then you can call the referring agency if you can't get a hold of the family. Okay. Then a question for Katie. Do you see an uptick in the number of annual preventative visits as a result of the statewide marketing campaign, or are you able to track this? Yeah, we are definitely going to be looking at that, but we made two major changes at the same time. One is the marketing campaign, and the other was that our EPSDT schedule for our statewide Medicaid, um, we changed our policy from visits every two years for adolescents to every year. And so we're hoping to definitely see an increase in visits, but we won't necessarily be able to attribute that. that. Um, so we are waiting on our... Um, report back from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, um, which will have um, probably in April of 2019. So we'll be anxious to compare. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Katie, maybe you can answer this one, too. I'm not sure. Um, Katie, who's a school nurse in Illinois, asked uh, notes that their school psychologists, um, schools don't have um, psychologists to to evaluate depression and anxiety. So what resources do your schools use for referral process, and is it common for schools in Minnesota to have psychiatrists who evaluate at the school? Do you know anything about that? I guess the one thing I would say about school psychologist services is my understanding, and this has been a big issue for primary care in general, is figuring out what has to be done in the healthcare system under the patient's health insurance versus what the school is responsible for and able to provide. And my understanding is that the schools are responsible for addressing anything that directly affects learning. So if it has to do with um, like a learning disability, um, there's more responsibility on the school end, whereas if it has to do with anxiety, um, then it's more of a medical system issue. Um, but that's something that we are kind of continually trying to understand better as we are recommending screening and referral, we want to better clarify school versus healthcare system responsibilities and possibilities. And Joanne or um, anyone else, I don't know if you have um, anything to add about that. I think to, just to add, this is Joanne, um, that, that many of the, the school services are co-located yeah, right. Um, Thank you for so differentiating that, that. Yes, yes. So there's the school counselors that exactly as Katie has described, but 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 much of the services we're referring to are co-located. So they're um, they're private organizations. They may be nonprofits. They may not be, but that are that are co-located in the school. They've gone through right. some sort of, of process, and then they can address any kind of mental health need. Correct. Um, but not psychiatry. I'm not aware of any psychiatrists. So there's no medication prescribers in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, that really comes back to, um, to us as pediatricians. I mentioned that we have a doctorate level nurse practitioner for psychiatry, but really if you look at our volume, she's really just seeing our most complicated patients. We've done a lot of internal education to begin to do that, um, to, to be able to provide medication management to our kids, which is not enough psychiatrists. So that would still come back to the, the general practice. Well, I want to thank you all today for attending our session with us, and I want to thank our presenters for their wonderful information, their willingness to share their experiences and their resources and their ideas. Um, please do look forward to get, uh, receiving some information from us about this webinar. Uh, if you have any further questions, please contact. And I will move to that slide. Um, our colleagues here, you can get a hold of them with their emails. Um, so we will be wrapping this up today. And uh, as you leave, um, we're going to be asking you to complete a webinar. That's something that our center is always interested in, our presenters are always interested in seeing. So um, please feel free to, to participate in this really quick evaluation as you leave. And uh, thanks for being with us today.